Hello, my name is Matt Knudsen. I'm an assistant professor of mass communication at the University of Central Oklahoma, and this is an analytical speed run of Studio MDHR's Cuphead. It's a speed run in the sense that I'll be running through the game as fast as I can, and it's analytical in the sense that I will be doing a live lecture on the game as I play through it. Over the course of this lecture, I'll be noting, referencing journalism and scholarship pertinent to the analysis and to Cuphead more specifically. These texts include Samantha Blackman's Piccaninnies and Pixels on Race, Racism, and Cuphead at E3, Yusuf Cole's Cuphead and the Racist Specter of Fletcher Art, Christopher P. Lehman's The Colored Cartoon, David McGowan's Cuphead, Animation, The Public Domain, and Home Video Remediation, Walter and Grusin's Remediation, Understanding New Media, and Bullock and Lemieux's Metagaming. The video here is live streamed to my Twitch channel. I will later upload a recording of this video to YouTube in which all of the works that I mentioned will be listed in the description to the video. I'm undertaking this project as a, as a means of doing public scholarship in new and interesting ways. So, wish me luck, and let's begin. The first thing you're likely to notice about Cuphead is its unique visual aesthetic. We see on the black screens here these blotches and streaks on the frame as if we're watching aged cellu celluloid, the medium on which cinema was initially recorded. And when we pause the game, the game informs us that it has a copyright of 1930. This is a fictitious copyright. Of course, this was a 2017 game. But part of the, that copyright is part of the world building that the Moldenhauers, who give their name to the abbreviation MDHR of the studio, have specifically cultivated. The game is made to look like a 1930s cartoon, both in the artifact that I'm the artifacts that I mentioned initially, as well as the hand-drawn aesthetic of the character design. The game is purported to have 60,000 frames of original hand-drawn animation, which is a record for which is a record for video games, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. We see that the character model here, Cuphead, he has these gloves, boxy shorts, big shoes. He evokes a visual, evokes uh, uh, he evokes the image of Mickey Mouse as from Steamboat Willie. Seems very close to Mickey Mouse in his um, body, and initial uh, initial responses to this game cited Disney as a key influence to the visuals of, of this game. In interviews, the Moldenhauers have actually indicated that the Fleischer Studio, a contemporary of Disney in the 20s and 30s, uh, was their most significant influence. In any case, as David McGowan argues in his piece, the game evokes a sense of 1930s-ness rather than necessarily the specific year 1930. To say a bit about the speedrun itself, you, you see that I'm swapping quickly between two different weapons. That is the, res the result of a quirk and how the legacy version of the software is designed. There was an oversight in how the cooldown works for weapons when you swap from one to the next, such that if you continuously swap, then you can get as much as double the effectiveness of a given weapon by basically shooting two weapons at the same time. So that's what I'm doing, swapping so rapidly between the lobber and the roundabout. I'm going to take some intentional damage here because we're actually close to the end of the boss. <laughs> it's a little too close. I'm running the game on simple mode, all bosses, legacy. And the reason I chose simple mode is for the simple fact that 
I'd like to be able to complete a deathless run. And running the game on regular is quite difficult and would pose a pretty significant challenge to try to string together coach and thought while running it. And the reason I selected all bosses as the category was to give enough time to have a full analysis of the game. The run will take somewhere around 22-ish minutes. As such, I make no claim that I'm anywhere near a world record pace, although this particular run is going well. Rather, the, this, the run is simply in a, a good enough place where I don't feel embarrassed by trying to run it this way. Another aspect of the visuals here, you can see this tree shimmering in distinction from the background. It's a very simple looking tree compared to the background. And as we move around, it, it appears to shimmer slightly. This is, this, this choice, it's very deliberate. It evokes cell animation in which the background is held constant and just the characters and the things that the characters interact with are redrawn from one frame to another. It was an invention, or rather a, a technique pioneered by the Fleischers and others during this time to make easier and less expensive the process of animation. Rather than redrawing the whole image, you could just hold most of it constant and then manipulate the stuff that's moving. It makes it a lot faster and less expensive to animate all of that. In the run, we have some levels on, in which Cuphead is running around on his feet, and others, like this one, where we're in an airplane. The weapon swap glitch, or exploit, doesn't really work right now for the airplane levels, but it will later when we get a second uh, weapon. So together, the, the artifacts that we see, the scratches on the celluloid, the Mickey Mouse-ish character design with the gloves and the boxy shorts, etc. The shimmering effect of the interactable objects on the overworld, and as I, as I said, the hand-drawn animation, all together performs what Bolter and Grusin refer to as remediation. They, this game remediates the 1930s cartoon into a piece of new media. It takes all these characteristics that are so familiar to us and repackages them into something new. This is the sense that um, McGowan uses in his essay on the remediation of Cuphead. At the same time, these visuals are inextricable from a racist history of anim animation that, as Christopher P. Lehman has demonstrated in his book, The Colored Cartoon, characters such as Mickey Mouse, Felix the Cat, and Bimbo the Dog from the Fleischer Studio feature jet black skin and... Uh, completely white lips, which is a familiar which is a familiar convention from blackface minstrelsy on the vaudevillian stage. That this kind of character design is at once economical in the sense that one doesn't have to illustrate all the grays in between black and white, but at the same time is a very it bears a striking and unmistakable resemblance to blackface min minstrelsy. As Bullock and Lemieux demonstrated uh, in their essay, uh, in, in their book on metagaming, the gloved hand of Mickey Mouse is also a convention of this style of blackface that now we see a similarly gloved hand on Cuphead that 
Also, in making reference to Mickey Mouse, makes an inadvertent reference to blackface minstrelsy. Samantha Blackman's essay on Piccaninnies and Pixels and her response to the E3 Cuphead trailer demonstrates the extent to which these, this inextricable association between animation of this era and its racist specter, to use the phrase of use of coal. All of this to, to Blackman provoked a response in her of making her head spin. And tro- she found the aesthetics of Cuphead deeply troubling in that it seems to pay no, no mind to this association between blackface and racist portrayals and cartoons. That the medium, as layman details, is indebted to is in, is indebted to thank you very much Felix is indebted to this racist history of of blackface and as layman further details the songs that were commonly used in these cartoons likewise likewise came commonly from blackface numbers from vaudeville and would have been quite familiar to their audiences at the time. That such numbers were regularly used in such such numbers were regularly used in Disney cartoons, Fleischer animation, etc. Blackman reaches the conclusion by the end of her piece that she would be skipping Cuphead, that um, this history of the medium is something that can't be overwritten, can't be ignored, it can't be denied. And her, her work certainly gave me pause about my own place of privilege, and caused me to reflect about my own place of privilege in undertaking this project. That, to talk about my own positionality, I did not come to Cuphead with the same set of associations, and it did not have uh, this effect on me of making my head spin and causing me to relive pain. Uh, of experiencing those kinds of racist portrayals. And I must, I must acknowledge my own privilege here with this, with this work to say that you know, I'm, I'm approaching this game from a place of privilege in that, um, in that to look at it as purely an aesthetic object would be, I would be, I would be remiss to treat the game as if it's purely aesthetic, and, there, and that it has the, that the aesthetics of the game have no social social ramifications. So it's in the spirit of being both engaged with and critical of even the media that we like, even the media that we enjoy and seek out. That. Um, that I <clears throat> that I'm coming to this project that I'm approaching this project from. I didn't mean to take that damage there yeah I thought we were close to the end of that The game has a number of really close associations between the in-game enemies and real-world characters, or rather, characters from 
animation of this era. Grim Matchstick is actually a reference to an, an, an animator of this time. Uh, and as Yusuf Cole talks about, there's a racist specter of Cuphead's that in interviews the Moldenhauers have been less than less than fully engaged with. To the Moldenhauers, they have uh, again that's the folks who developed the game. They have commented that for them they're leaving all of this racist garbage behind, and really for for them Cuphead is a purely aesthetic um, exercise. That. This this era, animating the the game as if it's from this era is is kind of a love letter to this is aesthetic as Maya Moldenhauer did in in a in a Rolling Stone interview. Yusuf Cole also talks about this character King Dice with his pencil mustache being. A close, a stand in essentially for Cat Calloway, uh, a jazz singer from Harlem who himself appeared in a number of cartoons, including some from the Fleischer studio. And this connection between Calloway and King Dice actually was essentially verified in the recently released trailer for Cuphead, the animated series from Netflix, in which Wayne Brady goes on stage and in a very Callaway-esque scat sings heedy 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 he. Cole's argument here is that the game can't really... doesn't, doesn't have I like to stand on for denying that there is this specter of racism in the in the art of the 1930s. That this very Calloway-esque characterization of King Dice and the emphasis on jazz, as well as Dice's proximity to or yeah. King Dice's proximity to vice, such as drinking, gambling, smoking, are part of the set of associations with blackness in this era of animation. The characters in this game sometimes seem very closely related to Characters from this era of animation. This last boss that we saw, Captain Briny Beard, bears a striking resemblance to Bluto from Popeye. And we'll see in a moment Kala Maria, who looks quite a bit like a Betty Boop cartoon in which uh, Betty Boop became a mermaid. Then the boss after that. It seems to be really closely modeled after olive oil, also from Popeye. And the clown that we saw earlier, Be Beppy the Clown, bears a striking similarity to Coco the Clown, a character that the Fleischers created using rotoscope animation. Similarly, Warly Warbles, the bird, looks unmistakably like a bird from the Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor film. So, the, the similarities are sometimes more than a little overt. And the sequence of bosses here uh, one after another that seem to be in dissimilar universes that don't necessarily all belong together. Like we have these two nautical bosses, but then before that we had a honeybee, and now we're walking onto a vaudevillian stage 
earlier we were in this like candy universe and before that we were in a garden and like they, they just seem pretty unrelated to each other. In McGowan's analysis, this disjoint from one level to the next really suggests the VHS style of distribution that the Moldenhauers were most familiar with. That the Moldenhauers, by virtue of not being 100 years old, weren't themselves present to 1930s animation in the theaters. Rather, they encountered this kind of animation in VHS compilations. Some might be titled, you know, Popeye and Friends or Betty Boop and Friends. And you would get, as, as McGowan details, like one episode of Popeye or one cartoon of Popeye, and the rest were the and friends who were along for the ride, packaged together in potentially a couple hours worth of content. And that such compilations uh, were, first of all, the result of some legal gray area. We have orphaned works and works that have their copyrights expired. And the folks distributing these VHSs and venues like gas stations weren't the original rights holders of the work, but were rather operating in this kind of gray area. And as such, we get this kind of motley assortment of cartoons. And in McGowan's analysis, that same motley assortment holds over to the sequence of bosses that we get. This one's almost done. Yeah. Also in these last levels, we get a more overt engagement with gender, gender representation. Previously, we had that level Sally stage play in which that character throws a fan at us and uses a parasol to sort of dive kick Cuphead. In effect, weaponizing these objects of femininity. We encounter Sally stage play on a on her on her marriage day. And then if we advance past that phase of the boss, we then move on to you know, after she's gotten married, we move to a domestic situation where a baby is coming out and throwing bottles at us. You can also play the game on regular, and if you manipulate the background in a certain way, you can actually kill the groom on the wedding day, in which case there there is no baby. And in the next phase of the boss, instead of a baby, we, we go to a convent where there's a nun throwing objects at Cuphead. This kind of over-the-top characterization suggests a tongue-in-cheek representation of gender going on that's critical of traditional gender roles, not all of which, of course, not all of which, of course, we have dispensed with today. And the game on the whole seems more critical and self-aware on the topic of gender than it may be on the topic of race. This is actually the last stage of the simple run. The run ends somewhat abruptly after this. The way that the narrative goes, Cuphead is responsible for collecting all of these souls, um, becoming kind of this gopher for the devil after he bargained his soul in an ill-advised wager. And... Because we're playing on simple, we don't have the final contracts of these characters. So instead, we approach the, the devil in a moment, or King Dice, we approach King Dice in a moment, and he essentially tells us no dice. And the, the run ends rather abruptly right there, without going on to the final levels in which we face off against the devil himself. So time's coming up here. Time, 21, 39. 
the PB. I actually just PB'd this thing. So, Well, great. Well, thanks so much for watching. Um, I want to offer my special th some special thanks in particular to Jacob, uh, a long friend, longtime friend and uh, moderator for this channel, who has been incredibly helpful and generous with his time, um, helping me with, with this. He's a much more accomplished speedrunner than I am and uh, has been a great resource for, for this. I also want to thank Fabix 531 for his help in detailing some of the specifics of the Cuphead speedrun, such as using the legacy version of the software, which helped save me a tremendous amount of time. And I'd like to thank El Torpiza, uh, another user who took the time to show me some of the Easter eggs of the game, including like where the last few coins are and how to unlock the fourth member of the barbershop. Of course, I'd like to thank my family, my wife and kids, for their support as I've taken on extra hours of streaming in the summer. And I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at the Department of Mass Communication at the University of Central Oklahoma for their support and their enthusiasm. So thank you so much. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. This has been an analytical speedrun of Studio MDHR's Cuphead. I will also be posting a B-sides argument of uh, of this in which I will run the game again and spend spend time talking about some of the other pieces of the argument that weren't able to that, that, that couldn't fit in one 25 minute video so thank you very much take care